Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to the EduSight Network. Our topic of discussion today shall be state and political theory and uh, friends for this very lecture and discussion we have amongst us our subject expert who has also been associated with us on previous occasions and we have greatly benefited from his lectures which are also present in our archives on YouTube. So friends, our subject expert today is Dr. Satish Kumar Jha, Associate Professor, Department of Political Science, Aryabhat. College University of Delhi and with this very brief introduction I welcome sir to the studio. Sir thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, in fact today's uh, discussion we are going to have on uh, you know the concept of uh, the state in political theory and as we have been discussing you know various concepts within political theory uh, in earlier lectures I mean this is a continuation of what we have done earlier. Now, most of the concepts in political theory, whether uh, you know it is rights or you know this uh, question of equality, justice, freedom, these concepts, uh, in fact, is very difficult to understand and conceptualize without reference to this basic concept in political theory that is a state and a state authority. Now, uh, there are different dimensions of this, uh, you know, uh, this concept. Uh, but today, I'll be focusing mostly on uh, not the origin. Uh, but on the functions of the state, uh, its legitimacy, uh, its utility and the debates which have basically uh, materialized around these issues over the period, long period in time, particularly in modern times. Now, one thing is very clear that the modern state is all pervasive. There is no uh, you know, a sphere of life which is not touched by the existence of this state. Of course, the two concepts are frequently uh, you know, uh, misconceived. One is the state, another is nation. Because normally, when you talk of a state, we talk of nation state. But there is a you know distinction between the two. I will also come to that issue later. But this all pervasiveness of the state is a modern phenomenon, and one can say that it has a history of around 400 years behind it. Particularly the way the history of Europe in modern times evolved and shaped, uh, you know, the different. Uh, histories of the world I and mean, the histories of different societies. For example, it, uh, the modern state emerged in the West, but gradually got transported to other parts of the world, particularly through the instrumentality of the colonialism and the colonial uh, discourse. So, in fact, uh, no uh, part uh, geographical uh, region in the world remain untouched with what was happening in Europe, particularly in modern times. So, that way one can say the imprint of this development in history in Europe on different spheres of life in different uh, geographical regions uh, in the entire world today. Now, what happens therefore, that this uh, all pervasiveness of a state has also been a matter of debate within political theory. There are many uh, defenders, but as well as there are many critiques of uh, this uh, you know phenomenon. The defenders believe that without a state, in fact, uh, there will be lawlessness in society, people's life will become miserable, there will be no law, there will be no order, no, there will be no freedom and therefore, in fact, uh, its presence is important uh, for uh, human existence. Now, this statement is as old as the Greek, uh, you know, philosophical tradition as many of you can, uh, of, of, of us can recall that even Aristotle had basically conceptualized it that man is a political animal, it cannot live outside. Uh, you know the you know police. So that way, in fact, this is not a new uh, you know acknowledgement or recognition. But what happened that gradually in modern times, uh, a different type of uh, you know social economic development, which uh, were basically uh, taking place, that led to a new conceptualization. And this conceptualization was along this line that the state is perhaps an important uh, you know concept. Uh, for uh, human existence. And it is here that the contribution of the social contract theorists uh, became very important because as uh, we will see later that uh, it started with Thomas Hobbes, but subsequently other social contract theorists uh, followed like Locke and Rousseau. They also use this contract argument to establish the legitimacy and justification of this state. Uh, authority. And it is here that a new dimension was basically uh, brought into the discourse and that dimension was the dimension of consent, that a state is our own creation. We have consented to this authority. It is basically not superimposed from above, rather it is our own creation. And this creation is essentially meant to 
and this creation is essentially meant to basically uh, to, to basically bring uh, both freedom and order uh, for uh, human uh, you know for human society. So, this way this was a kind of philosophical theoretical argument which was provided, but later on we find that this entire thing got divided this opinion among number of you know theoretical philosophical traditions which emerged. For example, on the one hand you had this uh, you know social contract theorists who argued that it is basically human creation and this has been created uh, in the interest of human beings. On the other hand, there are other you know schools emerge. For example, utilitarian philosophers started arguing that it is there because it serves our utility, it is basically for our happiness and it is basically has a utilitarian uh, purpose. So, therefore, they started looking at it as a basically from the point of view of utility. On the other hand, the other traditions also came into existence. For example, one tradition for example, this radical Marxist tradition started looking at a state as not a, an institution which is above uh, you know sectarian interests or above class interests and therefore, it came into existence. Uh, largely to serve the interests of the dominant uh, classes in the society and it continues to be so. And therefore, this entire argument in this tradition went along this line that sooner it is basically you know uh, removed, sooner one we get rid of this institution it will be better for human beings because then it will not basically serve the interests of the dominant and it will not lead to exploitation of the masses. So, this is basically class perspective which was also brought into the discussion. But along with that there were other traditions also, the Hegelian tradition which basically uh, looked at a state as the basically actualization or realization of freedom because family, civil society and a state the three categories which he basically invoked and finally discovered that the freedom ultimately gets realized neither in family nor civil society, but it only finds a full expression in the state institutions and state power. So, this way in fact various traditions are developed, we will basically come to uh, some of them uh, later. But to begin with in fact uh, some plenary observations are required that what is the state by the way and it is here that uh, in fact we should remember that uh, you know the state is a political organization uh, you know or is one can say it is an organization of power at social level. Uh, in fact, it is a political organization and therefore, what happens that uh, a state as a political organization acts through its agencies because a state is an abstract concept whereas, uh, its agencies are more concrete expression of this abstract concept. For example, the government is a concrete expression of this abstraction that is a state. Now, sometimes people uh, confuse the state and government, but in fact one thing we should remember that both are not identical uh, you know uh, you know thing. For example, a state is a permanent entity whereas, government is transient and basically a temporary thing it comes and it goes, but a state remains there. So, therefore, one has to keep in mind these distinctions. Now, we will come to it that how in modern times this differentiation in the social uh, life of the people has taken place and that differentiation has also consolidated the sphere of political or political authority and that rests you know totally within the state institutions. Now, Max Weber a German sociologist what he did that when he talked of the state uh, he said that you know he made a very interesting argument he said that a state is different from other institutions or other associations in the sense that a state has a monopoly over legitimate use of force on uh, you know common territory. So, this legitimate use of force is perhaps the monopoly of the state other organizations associations can also use force but it may not be legitimate at least in the eyes of the people. So, therefore, this legitimacy uh, which is basically associated with the state authority is perhaps the most distinctive aspect of this state uh, you know institution and state organization. Now, Weber uh, also talked of three different elements uh, which basically uh, you know dif differentiate a state from other organizations and he believed that it is territoriality it is the monopoly on physical violence and third it is the legitimacy. Three different dimensions he basically underlined which can differentiate a state from other social organizations. Now, territoriality because you know this territorial notion of a state is a very age old 
uh, element of the state, but in modern times it has acquired a more significance because you know so far as the allegiance is concerned it is not the state which can claim allegiance. There are many other organizations in society which can also claim allegiance of the people or it can exercise authority on the people. But so far as exercising authority on territory is concerned, it is perhaps the exclusive prerogative of the state and it is here this concept of sovereignty also comes into play. Now, the second important uh, dimension which we were highlighted was this monopoly of physical violence. Now, it is to be remembered that a state is not an institution uh, which only exercises uh, you know legitimate uh, legitimacy or it does not have only legitimacy function, but it also have coercive function and therefore army, police and such coercive arms of the state or apparatus of the state are very important for the survival of the state power and state institutions. So, this monopoly on physical violence is exclusive. Uh, basically jurisdiction of the state. Other organizations do not have this monopoly on physical violence and even if they have it is not considered legitimate, but when a state exercises this power it is invariably considered to be very uh, legitimate. Now, the third thing is this legitimacy aspect that whatever a state does people consider it to be legitimate and this legitimacy in the eyes of the people is not basically just accidental or it is not some simply created, but it is rather basically done in a manner where you know lot of agencies, lot of ideas come into play in society and where the state becomes only legitimate institution so far as uh, the various conflicting interests of the society is concerned. Now, it is here of course, the ideological debate also comes into existence between the liberals and the Marxists. The liberals would always consider a state to be neutral agency, would always consider a state to be above sex sectional interest, would always consider a state to be acting in the interest of everyone in society, whereas those who are not comfortable with this point of view, particularly the Marxists, the radical uh, thinkers, they believe that a state can never be a neutral agency, rather it is a partisan agency, it serves certain interests, sectional interests and uh, in their language or in their idioms one can say that a state is basically product of the class struggle and therefore, it continues to carry the imprint of its parentage and therefore, this parentage they explain that how a state has come into existence and it is here that they take recourse to this historical materialist approach in history and they explain entire historical evolution of human beings that how people started from a period which they call a primitive communist stage communism when there was no exploitation. It was something like Rousseau's you know a state of nature idyllic happiness, but from there what happened that certain developments took place and those developments are also mandatory because they are not within the current control of human beings, this is part of the nature of the reality itself and because of this development what happens that certain contradictions come into play and those contradictions ultimately lead to uh, changes in history, changes in society, changes in economy and then finally what happens that class struggle materializes and therefore, you know there is some institution is required on behalf which can act on behalf of the dominant interest and a state is one such institution. So, this is how the materialist interpretation of history is brought into discussion to explain the existence and the origin of the state. But on the other hand as I was mentioning earlier, the liberal tradition is quite clear. It always believes that you know the state is a neutral uh, agency, it is above class interests, it always acts uh, in the interests of everyone and when it comes to the functions of the state, the liberal tradition would argue that the most important function of the you know the state is reconciliation of conflicting interests that various there are conflicts in society, they would not deny it, but they would say that you know those interests are not are uh, irreconcilable, they can be reconciled and this reconciliation is done by the state. So, this is how these two traditions have been fighting on their interpretation of the functions of a state and debate goes on, we will have opportunity to touch upon some important dimensions of this debate towards the end of this lecture. But when it comes to the legitimacy as I was hinting earlier, when Weber identified three important functions, territoriality, monopoly over physical violence and the third legitimacy. So, legitimacy perhaps is something which makes the power which is at the disposal of the state quite legitimate and turns power into authority, because it is how one can explain authority also. And what is authority by the way? 
when power gets legitimacy, it becomes authority. There are many groups, many people, many individuals, many organizations in society, they may have power, they may wield power. Uh, but those, uh, you know, th th those power, I mean, those structures which have power uh, may not be legitimate in the eyes of the people, but nonetheless they exercise it. But only the power which a state exercises is considered to be legitimate. Now, of course, there are a lot of explanations, a lot of people feel that this legitimacy is acquired through force and violence. There is no denying the fact, as you were mentioning, that a state does not simply function uh, with those agencies which generate consent but, uh, consent, but rather there are agencies which also use violence, which, always, which also use force and that also is necessary for the survival and existence of the state. So, this coercive apparatus of the state is very important, uh, you know, feature of the modern state system. There is no denying this fact, but nonetheless, one can still add that this legitimacy which basically is provided to this power, uh, you know, of the state. Uh, and in fact, that legitimacy is a very complex process and this process has to be understood with reference to various uh, processes and various developments which take place in society. But one thing is very clear that whatever power is exercised by the state is considered to be legitimate and therefore, it is basically, uh, you know, it enters the realm of a different discourse that is authority. Whereas, the, you know, the, the force which is used by other organizations may be simply raw power, but the force which is used by state is not raw power, but it is authority. So, this is how, uh, in fact, oh, one can make a distinction between power and authority and this is where we find the role of the legitimacy, uh, you know, in making, turning power into authority. And it is here that Weber's statement becomes important when he says that state is basically uh, the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, loci of this uh, authority and legitimacy. Now, of course, this political obligation, uh, which is very important uh, theme in political theory, also uh, comes into play here. That why people obey the state, why do you obey the state? In fact, some of the important thinkers in political uh, theory have uh, started their discussion on the state with this posure that ultimately, why do you obey the state? What type of obligation uh, we have on us? to obey the state power and state authority. And this question that why should we and why do we obey the state is basically a question which is basically related to this question of uh, obligation, political obligation. What type of obligation we have to obey the state power? For example, one can give an explan uh, uh, example of uh, a policeman. If a policeman comes uh, to you with, with a notice, then you feel obliged uh, to abide and uh, you know obey that order. Why? because you feel that it is the duty of the state to serve this notice and it is your obligation to obey or comply with that order. Now, this political obligation or this obedience, uh, you know, how one can explain it? Now, there are different ways in which people have tried to explain this political obligation in political theory and political thought because obedience to the laws of the state is political obligation and why this obedience is basically uh, secured and how it is secured and how it is sought. Now, there are different explanations for this political obligation because it is directly related to this ent entire concept of the state. Now, one explanation of this political ex ob obligation which I was explaining earlier is with reference to consent and it is here and it is basically a liberal, uh, you know, uh, argument. And this is here, in fact, uh, that uh, we are reminded of the social contract uh, tradition in political theory. Now, the social contract theorist. Uh, may, you know, base this entire political obligation on the argument of consent that why the state has come into existence, who has created it. And the basically the answer which they provided of course, was more philosophically uh, argued explanation uh, with uh, you know, with reference to the contract uh, theory, uh, the state of nature. Uh, human nature in fact, first of all they explained human nature and then they also explained that how that human nature uh, was in that state of nature, that hypothetical state of nature which for example, Hobbes explained as a state of warfare, no one knew uh, what was his and what was others and therefore, that a state of nature uh, basically forced them to think of some alternative and that alternative was thought of in terms of entering into a contract 
and creating uh, an institution or an organization which will be uh, above them, which will basically bring uh, liberty and order to them, of course at certain cost. But then when those cost benefit analysis is done, then it is discovered that the cost, uh, you know, the benefits are much more than the cost. So you sacrifice something, you sacrifice your natural rights, but then you get, you get many things including you get legal rights, you get, you know, uh, you know, you order, you get freedom and so on and so forth. So this is how this consent argument comes into existence that how political obligation is secured by the state. The second of course arguments is as old as uh, you know uh, as human thinking that is the force and uh, one of the argument of the origin of a state was basically earlier was the force theory that uh, force begets the king that it is ultimately the force which is uh, the basis of this uh, power whosoever is strong uh, you know uh, wields power and you know basically turns others into subservient to you know to that power and so on and so forth the fourth and the third argument which is very common in political theory is of course a more moral uh, basically uh, realization that a state is uh, the highest realization or expression of individuality or in individual personality and it is normally associated with the idealist tradition in political theory in fact Hegel and many other idealists argued along that line that this question that why should we obey the state is something like asking that why should we, why my hand should obey my body kind of thing that it is integral part. I mean human beings are integral part of this organic whole that is the state. So therefore man uh, and woman they find the true realization in this state organization and therefore this is a moral realization and therefore it is ethical. Uh, you know thing and they basically uh, try to relate political obligation with this ethical argument. So this is how political obligation aspect of the state has been handled in political theory. Now so far the state structure is concerned. Now one thing should be very clear that a state structure is highly differentiated in modern times. Of course that was not the case earlier. In modern times what has happened that uh, the state is no longer a monolithic, monolithic organization. Now what has happened that a state is a set of institutions and those institutions uh, or organizations, the different organizations and institutions together create this state and the three arms of course of the state which are very important in modern times, they are legislature, executive and judiciary. Now what happens that with, with you know through these three agencies that a state particularly in a democratic uh, situation, democratic setup functions and all three have the differentiated role, differentiated functions. So differentiation of role and differentiation of functions are very important for modern state. Now this differentiation is of course the characteristic of modern era or modernity like different uh, spheres of society have got uh, a specific functions and this is how the structural functional explanation is also provided by sociologists and anthropologists. But here when you come to the political sphere, that political sphere is separated from the economic sphere, economic sphere is separated from cultural sphere, all spheres have their defined role and specific functions and it is in this context that it is believed that political sphere also has been separated and this separation has led to certain specific functions which are the prerogative of the state organization and state power. Now these three institutions which I was mentioning legislature and executive, legislature, executive and judiciary they perform specific functions and similarly the functions of the political sphere are different from the functions of the other spheres of society. Now what happens that in this context the government becomes the administrative organ of the state and as I was differentiating a state and government that should be kept in mind that they should not be confused with each other. A state is an abstract concept whereas the government is a more concrete one and government is in fact the administrative organ of that abstract concept that is a state. Now what happened that a state is of course uh, is also constrained by the constitution in modern time. There are there is a body of laws which is called constitution and it you know wields a constraining power on the state and government both. So these are the modern features which we can find in this entire concept of a state which may not have been there or perhaps it was not there in medieval and ancient times. Both the concept state has always been there, no one can deny it, it is not a modern thing, it is as old as ancient 
uh, you know, political uh, thinking or political tradition. In fact, we have had a very powerful discourse of a state uh, you know, power and state organization uh, in, uh, you know, uh, Arthasast of Cotillia. Similarly, we have had a powerful discourse on, on, on the state in ancient Greek political tradition, political thinking. We had Plato, Aristotle, many Greek thinkers which basically talked of the state and uh, its uh, functions and its role and its legitimacy and, uh, and so on and so forth. But it is the, the concept, the term is as old as ancient uh, you know history, ancient period uh, in human history, but the way it has, it is used today, the way it functions today is totally different. Oh, no one can make a comparison between the functions of a state in modern times and the functions as we saw earlier. So, what happens that conceptually one can say, that etymologically one can say that the state has always been there, but conceptually one can say that the modern state is different from its earlier counterparts. Now, this conception of history, uh, this conceptual history of this state, one can uh, uh, trace to you know uh, uh, to, to the you know Europe, you, you know particularly the modern Europe, and this uh, modern Europe, which gave rise to this uh, you know modernity, or in fact some of the concepts and values which are normally associated with modernity, uh, in fact uh, is quite significant. Now, what happened that as I was mentioning earlier that though it emerged in Europe, but later on it got, got transported to different parts of the globe and this transportation took place largely through uh, the medium of colonialism and colonial power. So, in fact, Asia, Africa, Latin America, Australia, North America and many different parts of the world also had the similar you know organization and institutions as they were emerging or they had emerged in the Europe. Now, what happened that late medieval period, uh, in fact, uh, the first uh, reference one can have of this modern state is in the writings of Italian philosopher Machiavelli, uh, particularly in his uh, book called The Prince, uh, which he uh, basically authored in 1532. And then from Machiavelli onwards, we find that a continuous tradition, which has basically focused on this concept of a state, its functions, its evolution, its role and so on and so forth. Of course, the Machiavellian use of this state was little bit different from the subsequent usages which we find in European uh, political uh, thinking. Now, for example, uh, when Machiavelli talked of state in his book The Prince, uh, it, he did not have an impersonal uh, understanding of the state. When he talked of state, he meant the prince, the king, the emperor. So, basically that impersonality which is associated with the state. Now, that impersonality is missing in Machiavelli's writing. Basically, it was personified, prince personified in the state. Now, what happened that in this process, we find that the first important major intervention in political theory and thought takes place with Thomas Hobbes. And this theorization of a state and its power, basically in Hobbes moves away from this you know, this you know, a personal to impersonal and it acquires an abstract and non-human uh, you know, dimension. So, basically what happens with Hobbes that this state power moves to abstract and non-human uh, you know, sphere and it becomes a non-human entity and this is how this modern sovereign state is understood by Hobbes particularly in his writing called Leviathan. So, what happens that this is a major uh, you know transformation and subsequently we find that this distinction between the rulers and the institutions that it is true that rulers rule, it is the rulers who wield power, but nonetheless there is a distinction between the rulers and the institutions which through which they rule. This distinction which basically implies that impersonality of power or impersonal standing of those who wield political power, in fact this new understanding of the state basically which is the hallmark of the modern state system emerges with for the first time in through the writings of Hobbes. Now, what happened that Europe this differentiation of various spheres of people's life also started taking place along you know around the same time the modern time because a lot of developments uh, had taken place in modern period in Europe. Some of them can be recalled, for example, Reformation, Renaissance, 
industrial revolution and so on and so forth. So, these were the developments which had basically far reaching impact on the society, on political thinking, on intellectual churning and those churnings basically got crystallized into a powerful concept which basically a state also symbolized. Now, what happened that political sphere is the apex body. In fact, apex uh, you know uh, organization or apex concept, this new realization was basically integral to this new conceptualization of this state as an impersonal entity. Now, what happened that uh, this, uh, this political realm, the separation of political realm and other realms as I was mentioning the differentiation which is another important characteristic of modern state. Uh, this political uh, uh, realm is different from other realm is one thing, but what is political? What is political realm? What is the sphere of political? Now, this itself constitutes a, a you know an issue for debate and lot of uh, you know scholarly minds have struggled with this issue that what is political, but it is outside uh, you know the purview of our discussion today. But one thing is very clear that it itself is a matter of contestation that political, what is political and it is here that contributions of the recent theoretical uh, schools, feminism and so on and so forth have made very important contribution. Now, what happened that this you know another distinction uh, because this differentiation which I was mentioning between the various uh, spheres of life also led to one another important differentiation or distinction which had important bearing on this conceptualization of a state in modern time and this is the distinction which has been made between state and civil society. Now, a, a state and civil society distinction is important because when you talk of a state, normally we talk of formal institutions, legislature, executive, judiciary, administration, so on and so forth. But civil society also includes some informal organizations, informal institutions, informal associations like parties, like clubs, like uh, you know churches, religious organizations and so on and so forth and they play a very important role in the life of the people in today's context. So, this distinction that what is the relationship between civil society and the state is a very important conceptual distinction which has been brought into discussion in modern times after this impersonalization of impersonalization of state authority and power took place. So, this civil society state that people's life both are considered to be important, but a state and civil society there is a distinction, there is a distance. Now, within liberalism it is also very uh, difficult uh, issue to basically uh, to, 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 to basically uh, to give a final judgment on this that what is the relationship, how the two can uh, you know interact with each other. This is a matter of great debate today when lot of people believe that civil society is a sphere of freedom. Uh, not the state, but civil society and it is also the sphere through which democratization process can be deepened. Whereas, the state is of course, the extension of it, but nonetheless it is not basically within it or it is not part of it. So, these debates are there and uh, in fact, this is contributing hugely for the you know for deepening and enriching of our democratic understanding of modern state. Now, what happened? that this differentiation uh, became significant in 14th and 15th century because political power at that time was held by number of agencies not only by state, but number of agencies for example, church, king, feudal lords all of them were exercising political power and there was no differentiation. Now, only in the after the treaty of Westphalia 1648 that this you know uh, di differentiation in the role of a state started taking shape and treaty of uh, Westphalia is important because this peace which was brought about by this treaty was basically also responsible for ending 30 years war in 1648. This was a religious war and basically what happened that this uh, treaty also basically signaled uh, the end of uh, the supremacy of the church or it undermined the power of the church and it gave king the authority over his own realm. So, this was the first important uh, development so far as this crystallization of state authority and state power is concerned, Westphalian uh, you know uh, development. 
So, this treaty of Westphalia is significant. It is this treaty of Westphalia which also defined the four essential elements of a state, basically territory, government, population and sovereignty. These four elements which people uh, you know, know uh, and uh, you know students are taught from the school days that these four elements are the important attributes of a state. These four attributes or elements got this currency, political currency only in the treaty of Westphalia. Now, it is here that a new conception of law also emerged, particularly the international law that how the states will have this international uh, you know interaction and intercourse and therefore, this international external and internal both type of sovereignty was also defined and demarcated. So, 1648 you know treaty of Westphalia is a major landmark so far as the evolution and conceptualization of modern state is concerned. Now, what happened that this sovereignty as I was mentioning the four important attributes of a state population, government, territory and sovereignty. Sovereignty perhaps is one of the most important elements of the state. It is only by the possession of sovereignty that a state can uh, you know consider itself to be independent or supreme. So, it is basically this dimension, this attribute which is perhaps a defining feature of the state. There are situations when uh, certain bodies, certain organizations may be uh, wielding power on a territory, may be having a government also, may be having a population within that territory, but in absence of sovereignty they are denied this stature or a status of the state. And therefore, political sovereignty is the only attribute which can transform a political uh, organization which is endowed with other three elements, but still not considered a state and the moment it gets political sovereignty, it basically acquires that stature that enables it to be called a state. Now, what happened that this territory of course, is also important that without territory uh, no you know uh, I mean uh, no organization can claim to be the state. Because if the simply allegiance is concerned, then there are many organizations in society which also can claim allegiance of the people. I mean, uh, people are affiliated to various organizations, and those organizations can be religious organizations, social organizations, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But what is most distinguishing factor of the state is that it is not simply allegiance of the people, but also its territorial affiliation and its territorial control. So, religious organizations may have the allegiance of the people, but it may not have the control on territory in modern times. So, this territorial control is very important attribute of the state along with the sovereignty. Now, what happens that uh, you know this two elements territory and sovereignty therefore, are the modern attributes and these modern of course, along with two other government and population I also mentioned, but these two are highly you know uh, uh, defining uh, features of the modern state institution. Now, civil society and state distinction I was referring to. Now, one thing is very clear that civil society stands for voluntary participation whereas, the state uh, implies not only uh, legitimate and voluntary thing, but also the coercion and that is why the coercive apparatus is so important. Now, what happened uh, that uh, a state also uh, uh, you know uh, is at times understood and conceptualized on amount of autonomy and freedom it is basically uh, or independence it is ready to give to various social institutions uh, within it. Now, the two differentiations which are quite common these days uh, totalitarian state and a democratic state or a liberal state this distinction is largely on account of this fact that what type of autonomy or freedom or independence a state is basically ready to accommodate within its own territory. What amount of freedom it is ready to give to various uh, civil society institutions and organizations. What amount of uh, you know autonomy it is ready to give to civil society activities and uh, basically actions. And those states which do not accommodate civil society autonomy and actions they are considered to be totalitarian states and where such actions are permitted, where such freedom people enjoy, where this autonomy is granted, it is considered to be a liberal state 
or a democratic state. Now, what happens that in totalitarian state, therefore, one can say that there is a fusion between a state and uh, society uh, in to some extent and this is how this idealist tradition in political thought has also looked at this issue because they feel that one is the extension of the other because their entire model is the organic model that like an organ like the body as a whole there are different parts. So, simply you know using the same analogy they would say that a state and society is one whole one organ and therefore, there cannot be any distinction between the two they are not separate one cannot assert autonomy vis a vis the other. But this model is argued uh, it is argued that this model basically results into this totalitarian tendencies and therefore, liberal state in fact is one which is basically ready to uh, give autonomy and freedom to various actions, various spheres and various agencies of the civil society and so on and so forth. Now, the another distinction which is also to be remembered so far as state is concerned is between nation and the state. Now, the nation of course, as I was mentioning like a state and government that a state is abstract and government is concrete. So, nation is a subjective consciousness where a state is objective expression. Now, nation of course, uh, is basically a state of mind, a psychological disposition. Now, there are number of factors who go, which go in creating this national consciousness or national, uh, you know, nationalistic feeling and some of those factors uh, could be language, could be, you know, could be, uh, you know, uh, history, uh, could be, uh, you know, even territorial affiliation, uh, could be, you know, religion at times. So, there are number of factors which can create this type of bonding among people which is normally called nation. So, basically nation uh, is also uh, at times is interpreted as a common memory of the people and this common memory of the people comes into existence because of number of factors like language, hi common history, uh, common you know territory, uh, common culture and so on and so forth. So, this is how nation is understood and a state as I, I was explaining it is a political organization of power at the social level. So, basically nation and a state do not coincide. What happened today in today's world that uh, in a same state you can have people belonging to different nations, people may have different national consciousness. For example, one can give the example of the Kurdish people. Uh, this is a nationality and now they feel that they are a nation and they are spread over you know across four or five different uh, states uh, and for example, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey all of all these countries all these states have people who believe in this Kurdish nation. So, what happens that they are spread across four different state systems, but nonetheless their feeling unite them. So, one state, one nation of course, is the idea behind this entire nation state conceptualization in modern times, but it is very difficult today. We find that in a multi-ethnic, multicultural, a multi-religious, multi-linguistic society which is basically now the order of the day, what we find that this one nation, one state thing is becoming quite difficult. So, therefore, what happens that today we are a multinational uh, state system uh, mostly. Of course, there are very few examples. There are also examples that there are people who believe that they are nation, but they do not have the state and then there are the states, but they do not have a nation. So, this thing is also part of today's political life uh, of the people. Now, what happened that also this problem is emerging that what will happen that when all nations can start demanding uh, a statehood or the right to self-determination. Because uh, if you start giving right to self-determination or a statehood to all nations, those who have this feeling, then I do not know how many times this entire global map would have to be redrawn. So, it is a big problem, the right to self-determination, this entire nation, the concept of nation taking form of a state. So, this way, this is one unresolved puzzle in political theory uh, today. Now, what happens that in course of this evolution, of this state and its differentiation from nation, civil society and so on and so forth. What has happened that the political theory has also engaged with one very important issue and that is the justification of the state. And this is what we started our discussion, the political obligation that why do we obey the state. And this is the question 
which is at the heart of this entire conceptualization of this state because its legitimacy, its political authority, all of them are contingent on this issue. That is the legitimate use of its power and it this justification of the state emerges uh, with this type of questioning, imaginative questioning or imaginative situation that what would happen uh, you know if there is no state. Now, is it a desirable state of affairs or not? And this is this imaginative situation, hypothetical situation, which is basically ha at the heart of the social contract, you know, political theory. Because they also started this hypothetical situation that how people were caught in a state of nature. As I was telling that Hobbes explained it that a state of nature was a state of warfare. And therefore, they wanted to get out of that state of warfare. And therefore, they decided to enter into a contract and through basically a covenant or this through contractualist uh, you know uh, mechanism they uh, arrived at a conclusion that there should be one authority one organization like a state which will basically bring freedom and order to them so basically this justification of the state that what would happen if there is no state whether it is desirable or not these questions in political theory have been tackled and handled with reference to human nature. And those who have argued for the powerful state, those who have argued for the desirability, desirability of a state, they have painted and depicted human nature in a particular light. And those who have opposed this state, its legitimacy, its utility, its significance for human life, they have basically looked at human nature in a particular way. So, it is Finally, or it is rather uh, one can say that ultimately the explanation or depiction of human nature which is at the basis or at the root of this justification or no justification argument. Now, it is here that this human nature thing can be explained with reference to uh, two important thinkers. One is of course, uh, you know uh, the Hobbes as I was mentioning Hobbesian state as it is often explained. And he basically looked at human nature as basically uh, one of uh, you know uh, in, in a negative sense. Whereas another explanation of human nature uh, is provided by thinkers like Gandhi or the anarchist political thinking, Tolstoy, uh, Kropotkin, uh, Bakunin, and many other anarchist thinkers. And anarchism, in a, as a tradition in political theory, believes uh, that a state is unnecessary evil. Unlike liberal, some traditions of liberalism which would say it a necessary evil, evil but nonetheless necessary, anarchists would go to the extent of calling it unnecessary evil. So, therefore, they believe that sooner you get rid of it, the better. It is unmitigated evil. So, therefore, they believe that human nature is so good that it does not require any external agency like a state to manage its affairs. It is rather intrusion or invasion in its personal and private affairs. So, therefore, it is a big nuisance. Whereas, on the other hand, those who have depicted and painted human nature differently, they believe that a state is basically a kind of concession uh, to human nature, because human nature is so bad that it cannot imagine manage its affairs and therefore, it requires a state. And it is largely a liberal construct, because they will consider a state to be a necessary evil, even if it is evil, but nonetheless it is necessary. Now, what happens that this contract theory therefore, uh, you know has based this entire justification of a state on consent and this consent is very important a liberal contribution, because they believe that a state is justified in its use of force, it is it's justified in use of political power largely because we have consented it. So, it is our consent which has created this state. Now, this contract theory when gives uh, you know basis for this con consent argument which is basically hallmark of this liberal state in today's world. The another branch of liberalism uh, which is normally called utilitarianism uh, looked at it from different point of view and for them it is not the consent which is the basis of the state, but rather its utility that whether I have consented it or not that is immaterial, but why it is important because it is useful for our happiness, because happiness is perhaps the most defining feature of this 
entire uh, discourse called utilitarianism. So, what happened? The greatest, greatest happiness of greatest number, and a state basically facilitates that. So, as a facilitator of that happiness, a state is useful agency, and therefore it is justified. So, we it is not only desirable, but it is necessary. Now, what happens that sometimes liberalism is also comes, uh, you know, uh, to conflict with this utilitarian argument, because what liberalism believes that sacrificing individual interest for the happiness of many is basically very unethical argument, which utilitarianism at times uh, seems to be furnishing, because greatest happiness of greatest number. So, basically, if the freedom of few and the rights of few are encroached and trampled upon for facilitating the happiness of more and more people, the utilitarians would perhaps accept it, but liberalism would not accept it. So, this justification from the utilitarian point of view, which is basically based on this happiness is countered by the liberal uh, discourse. Liberalism of course, when it comes to the functions of the state, it believes in the neutrality of the state and it believes that the state's main function is to basically promote uh, a common good or basically a, you know a kind an idea of good which is shared by all. But this neutrality aspect of the state of course, is perhaps the very important dimension of so far as the functions of a state is concerned. Of course, liberalism is also divided into two uh, strands of thought so far as the functions are concerned. One is the laissez-faire tradition which basically believes that the best government is that which governs the least, whereas another tradition which has basically evolved in 20th century and which is also acquiring lot of, lot, lot of legitimacy uh, is the welfare uh, functions of the state that it is not only uh, the governing the least, but a state has to intervene on behalf of the disprivileged and basically dispossessed. So, this functions of the state of course, the state uh, I mean the liberalism wants to keep within manageable limit, even if it is a welfare state, but still it does not believe in all pervasiveness of the state. But so far as the Marxism is concerned, the Marxian tradition, so far as functions of the state are concerned, Marx from the very beginning in his writings believed that a state is nothing but the instrument of the ruling class. And therefore, in the famous book which he basically wrote, Communist Manifesto, he declared a state to be the managing committee of the bourgeoisie. But this instrumentalist view that a state is the instru instrument of the ruling class is one aspect of this Marxian theory of the state. There is another aspect so far the functions of the state are concerned and this is a relative autonomy of the state that a state at times also acquires autonomy from the dominant interests, the ruling interests and the ruling class. Particularly the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, this book which Marx wrote in 1850s, particularly in the situation of France, revolutionary situation of France and when a state he argued was basically acquiring some autonomy from different class forces, because there was a balance of class forces in society and a state had to mediate various conflicting interests. So, these two dimensions of the functions of a state, unlike the liberal tradition on the functions of the state which wants to give full neutrality and autonomy to the state, the Marxist tradition would only give relative autonomy vis a vis the dominant class interest because the dominant perspective still remains that instrumentalist perspective that it is the instrument of the dominant class. Of course, in recent years a very interesting and uh, lively debate took place among the Marxists on this functions of the state, the Miliband Polanja debate at as it is referred on the instrumentalist versus the structuralist argument. Of course, within Marx in tradition number of developments have taken place over the years particularly with reference to the functions of the state. For example, earlier in this instrumentalist perspective, it is generally argued that a state functions with a coercive instrument, because it is a coercive arm of the state. And therefore, Marx also argued that in the ideal society, that will be the communist society, there will be no space for the state, because the state will wither away. But of course, in a transitional stage, when there will be poly, you know, dictatorship of the proletariat, the state will be required. But of later on, we find that Gramsci and Althusser, two Marxist uh, philosophers and thinkers, try to expand this Marxian uh, discourse in direction of hegemony, that how a state functions both with the help of consent and coercion. This is what Gramsci argued. And Althusser also expanded with reference to the ideological state oppressors. So, number of 
developments have taken place, feminism has also emerged in recent years as a critique of this thing and this debate goes on on the concept of a state in political theory. Thank you. Thank you so much sir for uh, talking to us about the uh, specific idea state in political theory and of course giving us a lot of insights and ideas and uh, points for us to ponder upon and with this uh, uh, very little or no time left, we take your leave. Thank you so much for viewers for watching. Have a wonderful day.